Um, my name is Caitlin Fowler. I'm a senior research associate at Evidence for Democracy, or E4D. Uh, for those of you meeting us for the first time, welcome. E4D is the leading nonprofit organization promoting and advocating for the transparent use of evidence in government decision making in Canada. Uh, we use original research, issues based campaigns, and skills training to engage and empower citizens to better interact with evidence um, and to cultivate public and political demand for evidence-informed decision-making. The session you've all tuned into today is part of our Evidence Matters campaign. The purpose of this campaign is to build a common language of science and provide people with the tools they need to better understand and ask for evidence. You can find more information about the campaign uh, at evidencematters2me.ca. Uh, my colleague Nada will link it in the chat. Um, and all of this information will be available, is available in both English and French. The campaign is funded by the Department of Canadian Heritage, so we'd like to thank them for their generous support. Uh, before I go any further, I would like to acknowledge that I'm speaking to you today from Ottawa, located on the traditional and unceded territory of the Algonquin Anishinaabe people. And our panelists and our moderator are joining us from a number of different regions, uh, home to their own Indigenous communities. You can learn more about the territories, languages, and treaties of the Indigenous people whose land you live on at nativeland.ca, which Nada will also put in the chat. So today we'll be talking about the intersection of evidence, community, and kind of democracy as a whole. So I ask that we all reflect on ways to intentionally seek out and include Indigenous voices and knowledge that have traditionally been and continue to be excluded from these conversations by settlers. So the following link, which Nada will drop in the chat, can help you learn about Indigenous knowledge, knowledge systems, which is relevant to our conversation today. A few quick housekeeping notes before I pass things off to our moderator. Uh, both chat and Q&A functions are available. Um, to keep things simple for everybody, we ask that you reserve the chat for comments uh, or if you'd like to share any relevant resources. And please put any questions that you have into the Q&A. It will just make it easier for us to, to keep track of everything. Uh, closed captions are enabled for this session. You can just navigate down to the bottom and there's a little CC kind of button that you can click. Uh, we do also have simultaneous French translation for today, so you can navigate down to the interpretation icon at the bottom of your screen and select French to listen to the discussion in French. So with all of that, I'm thrilled to introduce Carly Weeks, who will be moderating the session today. Carly has been an award-winning national health reporter with the Globe and Mail for 15 years. She has been at the forefront of Globe and Mail's coverage of COVID-19 since January 2020 and continues to write about the impacts of the pandemic on our health system and patient outcomes. Carly has brought national attention to important issues such as lack of access to the abortion pill in Canada and the rise of misinformation leading to attacks on health workers. For all of these reasons, Carly was a no-brainer to moderate this session, uh, during which we'll be talking with a number of experts about how citizens can develop skills to better understand and engage with evidence, and how these skills can be used to contribute to a healthier society and democracy. So Carly, take it away. Well, thank you so much. It is a real pleasure to be here today speaking about a topic that um, is of huge interest to myself, and I think um, more and more Canadians as we realize uh, the true stakes that are involved in um, you know, our quest for better information, better evidence. Uh, so I'm really pleased to introduce this panel and start off this discussion. So first I'm going to introduce Beatrice Wayne. Uh, Beatrice is a research manager at the Samara Center for Democracy. Uh, she has spent years researching and teaching about youth democratic, democratic engagement in Canada, the United States, Ethiopia and Australia. Um, and so welcome to this panel and she's gonna have a, um, we're each going to hear from each of the panelists in just a second. Um, and then next, I'm going to introduce um, Maureen Smith. Maureen Smith is a citizen leader who is committed to evidence-based medicine and patient and citizen engagement in research. Um, and a lot of Maureen's uh, leadership and advocacy stems from her diagnosis with a rare disease during childhood. So welcome, Maureen. Um, and rounding out our panel, I'm also pleased to introduce uh, Dr. Krishana Sankar, who is an award-winning researcher, trained scientist, and a sought-after speaker. Um, Dr. Sankar has been dispelling health and science misconce misconceptions for several years, particularly uh, during the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, she currently works as the science advisor and community partnerships lead 
for Science Up First, which is a really cool organization, um, part of, of the Canadian Association of Science Centers. Uh, so welcome, Krishana, and welcome everyone. Uh, it's so I'm so pleased to be here, a part of this uh, discussion. Um, you know, before we go further and, I, and we, we launch into the discussion part, sort of, we're each going to give a brief introduction and kind of a synopsis about how we approach this topic and why it is so important. Um, so, as mentioned, I'm a health journalist. I spend, you know, my days asking questions, trying to get the best information from experts and disseminate it to Canadians. And of course, we all saw during COVID, um, you know, just how political some of those topics have become um, and how great the dangers are of, of mis- and disinformation and how it can lead to the erosion of uh, to health, of, of trust in our health institutions and in democracy itself. Um, you know, currently in parts of southern Ontario, there's a huge outbreak of whooping cough among school aged children. Um, whooping cough can be prevented through vaccines. It can also be fatal, uh, particularly in babies. Um, and yet we're, we're seeing these outbreaks occur in part because, you know, there's been a lack of access to routine vaccinations during childhood, during the pandemic, uh, because things have been shut down. So there's definitely access reasons, but we also know that misinformation is also feeding into vaccine hesitancy among a lot of parents. So it's not hard to see the very real world effects that this is having on us today. Um, and just how, you know, we've seen, um, you know, in recent weeks, um, you know, allegations of harassment and, and abuse, even the governor general coming forward with some really disturbing accounts of how she has been attacked on social media um, you know, just for sort of speaking up and, and uh, being a public person. And so I think that, um, you know, health professionals across Canada have told me that they've been, you know, personally vilified, attacked, harassed and abused on social media. And uh, some of our very, um, you know, great institutions are being undermined because of that. So, you know, for that and other reasons, you know, I think it's really important that we try and take on, um, you know, these issues and try and figure out strategies and um, solutions for countering some of these harmful narratives. Um, so now I'll ask Beatrice to, to uh, please provide us with a brief introduction to this topic from your perspective. Hi everyone, I'm Beatrice Wayne. Thanks Carly for the introduction. Um, I'm the research manager at the Samara Center for Democracy as Carly mentioned, and I'm really delighted to be here. Uh, the Samara Center is a nonpartisan charity that is committed to securing an accessible, responsive, and inclusive democratic culture in Canada. And we seek to achieve this goal through securing transparency and accountability from our political structures and by supporting a vibrant and informed culture of civic engagement. So I see a lot of alignment between these priorities and the goals of the Evidence Matters campaign. We share a commitment to transparency in the way our political structures use evidence, and we share the goal of empowering the Canadian public with the knowledge they want and the knowledge they really need to participate actively in our democracy. So I'll briefly mention two ongoing projects of ours that are relevant to the Evidence Matters campaign. Um, and the first is our podcast, Humans of the House, that just launched yesterday. I'm really excited about it. Uh, in this six part podcast, we speak with a dozen former members of Parliament to hear in their own words what the job is really like. Um, because they are former MPs, they could speak really, really freely and openly, and they share powerful stories about what needs fixing in our politics, but also what is working and what could be even better. Um, this podcast provides really valuable information about what an MP's workplace experience is really like, to help support public understanding of the way our democracy does and sometimes does not function well, um, and the impact of online toxicity on the uh, working lives of MPs is a really big theme in the podcast and really relates to what Carly has been talking about. And I'll go into more detail of that later when I talk about um, more in depth and something I'm just going to mention, which is our Sambot project. This is another project we have, and that tracks toxic tweets sent to Canadian politicians during election periods. Uh, this project uses machine learning and natural language processing to evaluate how toxic a tweet sent to a political candidate is. We were really quickly able to identify that there was a concerning number of toxic tweets. During the 2021 Canadian federal election, we tracked an average of 511 toxic tweets per hour. Um, and this is really important because this level of toxicity is a condition of work for politicians, and it also affects how people engage in political discussions online. 
And it scares people, particularly people who are already underrepresented in our political institutions and are more likely to be on the receiving end of toxic identity attacks, scares them off from civic engagement entirely, much less running for political office. Um, and we think it's important to bring the data we've collected from Sambot into public conversation because understanding the extent of this problem and its effect on democracy is the first step in addressing the problem. So I think connecting these projects and the E4D campaign is the idea of transparency and accountability. We want to shine light on the experiences of MPs and on their humanity and the realities of the way toxicity is shaping our political conversations online. And I think a large part of providing citizens with the skills to better understand and engage with evidence is to make that evidence accessible and available in the first place. Um, and that's one of the things I really appreciate about this Evidence Matters campaign. Um, I'm really excited to participate in this discussion and to talk about how we can support critical thinking, digital and media literacy, and other ways to enhance our democratic capabilities. So looking forward to the chat. Thank you so much for that. That was really great. And I had a chance to check out the, the podcast. It is really approachable and I would highly recommend it. Um, Maureen, could you please now provide us with um, your brief introduction? Thanks, Carly. Hello, everyone. Bonjour. I'm pleased to be here today from Ottawa, which is a traditional unceded territory of the Anishinaabe Algonquin Nation. Last year, I was honored to be named a commissioner on the Global Commission on Evidence to address societal challenges, one of three citizens. And interestingly, the Evidence Commission's analysis of previous global commissions found limited engagement of citizens in all aspects of their work. So we are now in the implementation stage of the commission, working on three priorities, one of which is engaging citizens and citizens serving non-governmental organizations in putting evidence at the center of everyday life. So needless to say, the Evidence Matters to Me campaign and the two uh, great citizen guides are perfectly aligned with empowering citizens to do exactly that. So from my perspective uh, as a citizen, never has science and in particular evidence been more talked about, which on the surface is a good thing. Unfortunately, the happy dance didn't last too long because the antithesis of evidence, misinformation and disinformation also reared their ugly heads. So we're now living in a world where misinformation and disinformation flourish and are a threat to science, damaging citizens' decision-making abilities. And sadly, trust in the dissemination of evidence is also waning. At the Evidence Commission, we're working hard with special thanks to our citizen leadership group and all our partners and organizations such as E4D to explore solutions that can address the challenges of putting evidence at the center of everyday life. A few months ago, I had the privilege of observing two half-day citizen panels on, on the use of evidence of everyday, everyday life. People from all walks of life discussing the challenges and potential solutions. So firstly, very briefly, because typically citizens are left on their own to find, understand, and use evidence, we must help citizens judge what others are claiming or more generally find lots of great work being done uh, on a topic. And many organizations are devoted to doing this. To respond to the challenge, to the challenge that governments, businesses, and NGO, NGOs do not set things up to make it easy for us so for example, services and products are commonly offered or sold without evidence. We must make this evidence available to citizens when they are making choices and make evidence basically the default option. And thirdly, one of the recurring themes was that there has been an erosion of trust and that people are questioning the traditional trusted sources and messengers of evidence. We heard repeatedly that citizens would be more trusting of using evidence if they were involved in its co-production and dissemination. So simply put, engage citizens in asking questions and answering them with new research or with existing evidence. And I'll just leave you with a final thought the traditional disseminators of evidence, researchers, politicians, policymakers, the media, and trusted organizations should be working hand in hand with citizens and citizen serving NGOs to ensure that the evidence is communicated effectively, is accessible, and addresses what is relevant to citizens and their decision making needs. Thank you, Carly. Well, thank you so much, Maureen. Really looking forward to 
chatting with you some more about that. Um, and Krishana, please um, provide us with your brief introduction and before we get into our Q&A. So good morning or good afternoon, everyone, depending on where you're joining us from. Um, my name is Krishana Sankar, and I am the in-house science advisor and the community partnerships lead of a very cool initiative that Carly mentioned called Science Up First. And we are an initiative of the Canadian Association of Science Centers. I'm honored to be here today. So thank you so much uh, to E4D for having me on this panel with um, my amazing fellow pan panelists. And I'm not sure if everyone could see, I think both Beatrice and I were nodding a lot when Maureen, Maureen was giving her introduction, and that's because, um, you know, misinformation has been around for a really long time. Um, but it, you know, of course, it's it reared its ugly head even more during the pandemic, and that's how Science Up First actually came to be. So when the pandemic started in 2020, um, there was a lot of misinformation flying around on the internet. Um, a few researchers and politicians actually came together to start and create Science Up First. And so it's actually an initiative that is co-founded by the University of Alberta and another um, initiative called COVID-19 Resources Canada. So what is Science Up First? It's a globally recognized anti-misinformation initiative, like I mentioned, of the Canadian Association of Science Centers. And we are actually present online. And why is that? Because we know a lot of misinformation actually flourishes and spreads on social media platforms. So for example, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and TikTok, just to name uh, the main ones. So we actually share the best available science in creative ways to help stop the spread of misinformation. And this is important because we need to actually meet the public where they're at on these social media platforms. And we try our best to create a very engaging and safe space for people to ask their questions and engage with us. So as Maureen was mentioning earlier, ensuring that people are actually part of the process of you know, sharing, disseminating, creating information is what, uh, not creating information, sorry, but, you know, being part of this information sharing is what is extremely important in order to get this information into different communities and, and ensuring there's accurate information uh, to help stop the spread of misinformation. I'm not sure how many times I can say information. Uh, so we also use the collective impact model uh, to reach beyond social media. So although Science Up First is primarily found on social media platforms, so our handle is at Science Up First on all the social media platforms I mentioned, we also work with our community partners. And so this, of course, is extremely important because as we are aware, there are multiple publics. Uh, you know, there's not just one general public. And specifically what we saw during the pandemic is that there was a lot of gaps in information. And of course, that's where misinformation flourished. A lot of different uh, equity deserving communities were actually left out when it came to sharing of this information. And that's why we really insist on working with these equity deserving communities. Now, how do we uh, work with communities other than our social media posts that we create uh, we also uh, have been engaging in public events um, a lot of our community engagements so when I talk about community engagements you know we've done gamification as a way to share information back with the community and also get those different community leaders and influencers involved in sharing of this accurate information we've done it through flow through grants to our cask membership uh, to continue do doing their own work with an equity deserving communities. We've done content co-creation. So this, uh, in particular, we have a translation liaison model with a specific South Asian um, initiative that works within South Asian communities on Ontario. And of course, we've done lots of community events. Uh, we've been supporting researchers across Canada as well in order to help collect social behavior data. So we've been working with the University of Alberta and University of uh, British Columbia and Simon Fraser University. And we're doing uh, capacity building. So this is one of our most recent projects, which has been um, asked of us very many times, which makes a lot of sense. But lots of people have been coming to Science Up First and asking, you know, can you help us help people to, you know, develop these skills to spot and stop misinformation? And so that's another one of the ways in which we are helping to do this type of work. And I'm happy to be able to discuss this further as we go along in the panel. Thank you so much for that. Sorry, I just had problems with my mute button. Um, it's always something. 
So thank you all so much. And I, I wanted to mention too, for those of you who are listening, we are going to have some time for a Q&A from you at the end. So please feel free to add your questions into the chat and we'll be getting to those in just a bit. But I wanted to leave things off by asking the group to kind of weigh in. Um, you know, one of the common refrains that we heard during the pandemic was, you know, that I'm going to do my own research. And it seems like, you know, um, whatever channel you look on now, there is evidence to fit whatever conclusion you want to reach. And this is something that has become, I think, a bigger and bigger problem. And there's organizations, you know, of physicians popping up that look very legitimate and credible, but are actually, you know, if you kind of dig a little bit deeper, the evidence that they're espousing or promoting is very flimsy or published in a non-existent scientific journal. And so, you know, I guess the question would be really, you know, how we kind of can even frame this idea of what is good evidence and how we can empower people who are out there to kind of tell what is good from what is not so good um, and really try and, 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 and suss that out so that people are not being manipulated into believing you know, some of these really radical conspiracy theories or what have you. Um, I'm not sure who wants to jump in first, um, so feel free to take it away. I don't know if, it's, um, if Beatrice wants to start us off or I don't know, Kishana, I know you guys, um, I see both of you nodding well, so just uh, maybe Beatrice, I'll call on you first. Sure, I will just say really quickly, so much of what Maureen and Shana said really resonated with me and I think applies to this question. I think on one hand, the term uh, doing your own research or or uh, I'm going to, I'm going to look into myself has been maligned now. We're like, oh no, that's a bad thing. Like it, 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 that leads to misinformation. But I think we absolutely need to reframe that. We want to encourage people to do their own research. We want to people to feel empowered and have the tools available for them so that they can do that. I don't think that we should be wielding expertise like a cudgel or like a, a black box that we present to people that say this is good evidence and this is bad evidence. We want to help people feel empowered to do the research themselves. Um, and that, that a lot of what Maureen and Krishana was saying really resonated with me in terms of thinking about co-creation and co-production of knowledge, meeting people with an assumption that they have really valuable knowledge and experience to bear and an ability to evaluate the research. And I think a lot of the sort of way that there's important tools that I know Evidence for Democracy is creating resources that we need to make easily available. But I think another step is transparency and allowing this information to be easily accessible to people so that they can do their own research and meeting them with a respect, which I think crimes the brain for curiosity and complexity. And I think those are the two key aspects you need to do good research, to engage with evidence. You need to be curious and you have to be um, willing to engage with complexity. And it's hard to do that when you feel like people are um, presenting you with evidence that has already been evaluated, that you have no role in evaluating yourself. Um, and I also would say, I think, um, sort of accepting the humanity of the people and thinking about the humanity of the people that you are engaging with and interacting with. Um, I think that's one of the reasons we made the Human of the House podcast is because we talk about um, politicians in such a dehumanizing way. And I think it's really hard then to uh, evaluate the, the job they're doing, think about the role that public officials play in our democracy when we think about them in that in that way that isn't deeply human, that isn't uh, compassionate, that isn't um, from a place of understanding. So that's my initial thoughts, but I'm so interested to hear what Krishana and Maureen have to think. Yeah, and I'll call on you guys in that order. And I just wanted to touch on that point you made about transparency. And I think that that's often what we have been maybe lacking a little bit of um, in, during the COVID pandemic around some of the decisions that were made and why they're made. Um, so Krishana, Feel free yeah, like, to talk to us about your um, experiences maybe during COVID and how this whole idea of kind of approaching um, the idea of what good evidence even is. Yeah, I mean, you know, everything that Beatrice said, I, I love that it was packaged in, in a general uh, way, but trust and transparency, um, you know, to some of two of the most important pieces when it comes to people consuming information. A lot of people, um, you know, during the pandemic were, you know, we weren't getting information, number one. A lot of people weren't getting information. There were in information gaps. And so this will then lead people to go looking for their own information. And I appreciate what Beatrice said, which is, you know, um, demonizing the term, um, you know, you know, doing your own research, I don't think is the way to go. Because we do want to empower people to be able to get their own information, but it's how and where 
you know, you go for those, you know, where do you go for the sources? How do you, you know, filter through this, the critical thinking skills? Um, and there are several places where, you know, people can go to for this type of information to help them tackle, you know, how, how to spot and stop misinformation, for example. I mean, Science Up First, of course, has great resources. So, is, so does Evidence for Democracy. So does Media Smarts, which is, is another one of our, um, you know, partners. And so I think even, um, you know, a little bit more granularly, there are a few things that, you know, we often talk to people about, like, for example, who is the author or the creator of this post that you're looking at, right? Does, does this person actually have the expertise to speak on this topic? Because it was one of the things during the pandemic, and I know Carly, actually everyone here probably knows, anyone and everyone was talking to anything and everything if they could. There were so many armchair experts during this time, which you know made things even more confusing. Um, and I will also say that, you know, unfortunately, even experts, you know, quote unquote, were spreading misinformation. And that's because there were some experts who actually didn't have expertise in that particular area um, who may have been misspeaking or spreading misinformation. And then I know that usually will cause even more confusion in our public because we often say, go to the experts, but then which expert are you going to, right? Um, you wanna make sure that you know quoted so sources are also credible and reputable. What sources are you gonna go to information for? This is extremely important because certain sources will have an agenda and others are actually there to share accurate information. And I know in the Q&A section, I think Gordon, you know, was mentioning about evidence about misinformation, disinformation industries, you know, originate with corporations which profit. And this is what's really important because we need to know, are you reading information from an organization that will profit from this? That's usually a huge red flag, right? Um, and then we saw a lot of this too. There was cherry picking of data. So a lot of misinformers use this tactic where they cherry pick data um, to, you know, to spread or, or to go along with their narrative that they're talking about. For example, you know, for example, around the vaccines, right? If there was, you know, one bit of information that was, you know, saying something slightly differently, but wasn't even confirmed, they will grab that bit of information and make an entire narrative around it to spread misinformation and fear. You know, fear is one of the number one things that also helps to drive misinformation and the spread of it, right? Um, and usually we can tell when, there is a topic that, or a headline that evokes a lot of emotion, especially negative emotion. We know negative emotion runs rampant. Um, the moment you see a headline or a topic with, you know, that sounds sensationalist or drives negative, you know, strong negative emotions, you need to take a step back. And I know at Science Up First, we usually talk about this as well as taking a pause. It may be something very simple, but usually just taking a pause, you know, to reflect, you know, read and, think critically about the information you're consuming before you share it has actually been quite effective in helping people to you know stop themselves from sharing misinformation because it's extremely important that we really critically think and, and, and analyze the sort of the information and the data that we are consuming uh, for ourselves but then also before we share it so I know that was a lot there but I thought I would you know share some of the things that we do and some of the tools and, and, and the red flags that people need to look out for. That was really helpful. And I think, yeah, so much there to, that we can continue discussing. So thank you for that. And Maureen, as someone who is obviously, you know, representing citizens, um, you kind of have your finger on the pulse of how people are thinking. I mean, what, I mean, when people are out there looking or, you know, doing their own research, like what are people considering as evidence? What are they looking for? Um, some strategies and solutions. So first I want to support what uh, um, Beatrice and Krishana said that we absolutely want to empower people to look for evidence. I come from the patient community, more specifically the rare disease community. For us, evidence can be finding a diagnosis, choosing the care that will result in the best outcomes for you, taking the right medication, and the list goes on. And then when you added the complexities of the pandemic, uh, as people with medical conditions are often more vulnerable to serious illness, that created that, that created a really difficult situation for patients. So yesterday, uh, the National Collaborating Center for Methods and Tools at McMaster University released a rapid review on the public's experiences, access and inter interacting with public health information. And you know, I'm going to put it in the chat. I, I would encourage it's not very long. I would encourage people to use it. It talks about how people actually interacted with the information that came from the public health units and why 
why throughout the pandemic there were issues with interacting with that information because it it was changing but it wasn't explaining why it was changing and it wasn't necessarily geared geared to them but just briefly at our citizen panels which were two half days I heard the most discouraging um, statements I heard a lot of optimistic statements and people saying we want to engage with evidence but I heard people say that uh, the misinformation side is winning and that what's the use like what's the use how are we ever going to win this that was as a person who's been over 20 years working for evidence for citizens that was just heartbreaking to hear that but I can understand it so there's that infodemic and some people are just overwhelmed by the situation that review that came out yesterday supports that so they found that people some people are just not looking at any kind of evidence at all because they're just so confused by everything out there so i i, I think you know and any in those citizen discussions even the trusted sources of evidence who we were our, our go-to sources were questioned because there's there is so much mistrust now in the disseminators of evidence and the creators of, of evidence. So so again, um, people are looking for evidence where there's some kind of you know co-creation happening. Like were there people involved in 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 you know in getting in getting that information? And last week I attended the E four D E D four E four D webinar and I learned a new term called epistemic trespassing. Which is which is which is where you um, where there's a blurry line between people who are supposedly experts and they're they're very confident and and so that that's been a big issue too. So I won't go on much. So I could talk about this for three hours, but I think basically um, what we heard is that people want to engage with evidence, but they're overwhelmed and they're not trusting the sources that they trusted necessarily before the pandemic. Thanks. Thank you so much for that, Maureen. And, you know, you guys have all raised such interesting points. Um, I'll ask you, Maureen, to maybe jump back in briefly, and then we're going to keep this discussion going. But, you know, you, you spoke, uh, I think, really eloquently about um, some of the experiences of citizens and patients. So I wanted to ask, you know, we're, we're talking about a real societal problem. And I think that sometimes the emphasis is, is often put on the individual, you know, um, ignore the online attacks or, you know, here's the work that you have to do. And so I know that you're obviously you're, you're representing sort of citizens, but I thought just if you could briefly touch on, um, you know, maybe some why this is so, you know, critical to look at from also that broader kind of societal lens. And it's not simply just sort of, you know, saying the individual does need to be empowered, but we need to move further from that. Um, and then I love the, the rest of the group to jump in as well. Yeah, well, for me, it's all about responsible citizenry, citizenry and democratization of science. And, you know, people, people just say those, oh, we want to democratize science and we want to get everyone involved in science. It's not easy to do. You've got to demystify it. You've got to explain it. And the ways that sometimes people think they can do that work for, for their age group or their, their people, and they're not thinking hard enough at reaching the people, all of the citizens who want to be engaged and to teach them the skills in the way that respond to their needs. So different ages, different health literacy levels, different interests, different ways of learning. And I'm working right now on a project with the public health unit in Ottawa with with equity, um, equity deserving um, groups and working with citizens who live in those neighborhoods. And you just have to sit down and you have to ask them what would work? What recommendation can we make to the public health that would work in your community? And I remember someone saying, you know, if you set up your, your, your booth at, at the back of the library, you may not get so much traction. But if you set us up right at the right at the entrance of the Walmart and you gotta you gotta like some some candies or some apples and you're giving it, we might we might come to you. And so you you've got to you just have to listen. And the sad thing is that. The people who are most affected by misinformation are often the people who we are not reaching. And, and just because you you don't, you know, you, you didn't go to university, it, you know, doesn't mean that you can't understand it. Everyone can understand science. It's a matter, it's on us, it's not on them. So, so 
we blame the people like that's blaming the people that's a huge thing no we need to blame ourselves so what have we not done to find out what the needs are and what works for them so i think that's that's what we that's what we heard and in those conversations that we had we had about 34 different people the um people were really good about pointing out that you know what maybe i can read that and i can do it but my neighbor is is unable to do that and you know they want to participate too. What are you doing about that? Stop there. That's that's such a great point. And I, I know from my own uh, reporting of many examples where once, um, you know, health groups set up, um, you know, in apartment buildings where people live to answer questions about vaccines, all of a sudden, uh, a lot of some of the myths and concerns went away. Um, Krishana, I know this is something that you've you know, done a lot of work in. So maybe you can speak also just about how you can kind of reach some of those groups um, and some of the strategies and solutions that that may be effective in terms of you know reaching the you know to Maureen's point, everyone has a different experience and is coming at this from a different lens. Yeah, I mean, I don't I think my head would fall off with all the nodding I'm doing. <laughs> you know, it's like um it, first of all, they're different pod lakes, like I mentioned before, and that's what's really important here. What you know, what one solution uh, to one, you know, public does not fit everyone. It just doesn't. And that's just the reality of it, right? We have to, first of all, acknowledge um, we have many different communities um, of, you know, people in different circumstances, situations, age groups, the demographics are, are a lot. And so some of the things that we've been doing at Science of First that have we've found to be very, you know, very effective. And mind you, you know, some, some of the things would don't require funding, but a lot of the things do require funding. And I think that's one of the really important points that um, you know needs to come across is that funding makes a huge difference. Like I said, we don't always need it, but you know, we work within the limits we have, but if there's funding there, it can make a huge difference. And so a couple of examples of this. So some of the um, communities that we work with that serve um, indigenous communities, what we've been doing in the back end is, you know, like during during the pandemic, we've had a Q&A round table. But instead of bringing in, you know, any expert from anywhere, we're bringing in experts from their specific community to talk to their own people. It was so important to do that because it's not only getting the accurate information to the communities, but who is the communicator? Who is the person that's distributing this information to the community? Because trust, again, it comes back to trust. Trust is very important. People tend to trust those who are, you know, giving them information from within their own communities. Um, so on the back end, we were able to help, uh, you know, those communities just support them on the back end on doing these types of roundtables, doing these types of information sessions. Um, different communities will also distribute information in different ways. So another uh, way that was really important for this community is they were doing it through posters, through word of mouth, through pamphlets, and they were literally going door to door handing out these bits of information. Again, we were able to support them in creating these types of, you know, in information bits. So at Science Up First, we're creating content, yes, that goes out on our social media channels, but we are also very cognizant of our content may not reach everyone in the way in which they, you know, would consume the information. We partner with the different organizations that are, um, you know, doing work with the, with the different communities to make sure, first of all, is this information even accessible to this community, right? A lot of communities may speak different languages. People will consume the information in different languages. That's number one. Number two, is the information culturally relevant? I've had uh, a few conversations with some of our partners in the indigenous communities and in the South Asian communities to say, for example, Science Up First may create great content, but if we use a pun in there that doesn't translate well to their community, they, they won't get it, they won't understand it. And that makes sense. So now they have to go and make it more culturally relevant. But in forming these types of relationships, it helps a lot because number one, we have the expertise in communication, we have the expertise in science and health, and then that helps to then translate over at their end it 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 helps to release some of the burden in creating the actual content. They don't have to do that at this point. You know they're able to translate and then make it more culturally relevant. I also saw um, I think a comment in the Q and A about um, ensuring that there is also respect in terms of the ways in which knowledge is shared, and that's been extremely important to us as well. So for example. 
being sure that the way in which the information is coming across, number one, we can never be condescending. I mean, that just doesn't work. Like, how does that make sense, right? We're all in this together in terms of sharing and trying to understand information. The way, again, in which we do this is just different. So ensuring that we share this information, but letting that community have the free range of making this information culturally relevant while ensuring the scientific integrity for the Western medicine is maintained, but also respecting that each community has their own way of, uh, you know, their way of knowledge sharing or their own medical practices. That is also very important. Um, and I think because most times when we come at it from, okay, well, I'm here to give you this information and share it with you, you know, share it as is without empowering that community to do what they already do, you know, that is extremely limiting and, and extremely disrespectful. Why would that community now, you know, be able to share that information beyond us within, you know, within their own communities, within everyone else in their, in, in their networks? And so, so that's, those are a few ways in which we've been working, you know, with, with our community partners, especially within the equity deserving community. Thank you so much for that. And I, I know we're, um, I want to get some of the questions because there's quite a few. So Beatrice, I'll ask you to weigh in, provide your perspective. And then also just, you know, to kick us off to the Q&A, maybe provide one hopeful example that you've come across where there's maybe it's a different region of Canada or a different country that's doing something that, that is working to help push back against some of these harmful narratives. Absolutely. So I, I again, just nodding, nodding, nodding um, <laughs> at Maureen and Krishana, but I think in sort of response more largely to the idea of responsible citizenry, it's not reasonable to expect citizens to navigate mis and disinformation on their own. It's, it's not about a level of access to information. It's a systemic problem and we have to provide systemic solutions to this. We need public investment in this. We need a digital and media literacy program that helps um, high school students, even younger than high school students, with equips them with the tools to navigate this going forward. And we need to have uh, digital and media literacy programs for adults who, who need help navigating as well. We need to invest in that. And one solution, aside from you know, curriculum changes to more deeply embed media and digital literacy into our school programs is really investing in public libraries. And I think that that goes to Krishana's point of meeting local communities where they are and being able to respond to the specific needs of specific communities. When we invest in uh, public libraries, that's a really great resource for public education. Um, and I know that, for example, for an example, uh, the Toronto Public Library is doing really interesting uh, stuff with uh, teaching around AI and how artificial intelligence works now and the questions we should be asking of new technologies like chat GPT. Um, also Control F is a really uh, exciting and interesting program for helping students navigate uh, digital literacy. Um, but we really do need, you know, investment in that. In Ontario, just for example, uh, that digital literacy programs are run through libraries, but a lot of uh, high schools in Ontario don't have a permanent full-time librarian who would be running these programs. So there's still like places where there's have and have nots even in high schools in terms of access to this information. And we need to consider and address that. Thanks for sharing control F. Um, and more broadly, there's um, I think a lot of really exciting stuff going on with citizens panels and citizens assemblies and places like institutions and experiments like that, that are giving citizens the opportunity to evaluate evidence and not just sort of establishing trust that people trust their government, but showing that their government trusts the people to evaluate evidence and to and to learn from them. And that I think is important, but I'm really excited to hear from Krishana and Maureen on this. Thank you so much for that. And, uh, and with that, I'm gonna pivot into some of the questions um, simply because there's a lot of them we wanna to get to as many as we can. So if you can you know, limit your answers to a minute or two, that we, I think we should have plenty of time. Um, and you know, this is. I feel like we could have this discussion all afternoon. I mean, these are really, really important 
uh, points that everyone is raising. And, and I think that that idea of investment and really kind of prioritizing this is one that comes up again and again when I have these conversations. Um, you know, right off the top, there's been a number of comments and questions just about, you know, open access journals and media behind paywall. Um, so I can't speak to journals, but I know from a media perspective, this is an ongoing challenge. There's, um, you know, a lot of people who can't necessarily pay to read the news and it's um, maybe driving them to find their news and other sources. You can't even find <laughs> news right now on, um, you know, <laughs> certain very large online search platforms and social media companies. So there's a lot of issues there right now, but I, I will say that, um, you know, good journalism does take money to produce. And so that is a real um, issue that, you know, we can talk about another day on a media focused panel. Um, I think for our purposes, you know, jumping back in to, to our group, um, I'd be happy to open this to the group, but there's a, been a couple of questions I'll sort of combine, but really, and that's about ideology, that, you know, you can present people with facts and evidence and say, you know, this is true, but this works or this doesn't work. And, and some people will simply continue to deny it because of a certain viewpoint that they have. And there's been studies that actually show that people with certain um, you know, political leanings or ideological sort of points of view, it's almost an identity that is wrapped up in believing a certain point of view. You, you may not be able to ever sway them. Um, and this is becoming more of a problem in today's political climate. So, you know, I don't know if, um, if, if Beatrice, you want to, as, as someone who sort of does a lot of research in democratic institutions, if you want to just to Wing in quickly on that, and then maybe I'll ask Maureen and Krishana as well. Yeah, I guess one thing I will say in response to this sort of on a hopeful note, there is research that shows that people get really locked into these identities that and uh, they can then uh, sort of build a whole um, alternative universe around the misinformation that they have access to. But there's also really good information that shows when people are exposed to people with different viewpoints and actually interact and talk with them and know someone on a personal level who has these different viewpoints, they become much more, their, their brains become much more malleable and open to being, uh, to considering other viewpoints and to being curious and to um, changing their point of mind. So I think that sort of the, that side of the research is where we can you know, take a lot of investment and um, a lot of public policy expanding options for people to have exposure to different points of view through places like public libraries. Um, and I think the question of open access is huge um, in terms of who has access to, to information in English and in other languages and ensuring that people do have access to that. It's all well and good to say, well, make sure that what you're reading is a peer reviewed journal if you can't, if you don't have access to a university library, the amount of peer reviewed journals you can read is pretty limited. So I think we really need to take that into account. Maureen, what do you think about that? I mean, maybe, you know, adding to what Beatrice said, but also just that idea that, you know, there's certain people who we've, you know, all been sort of told you, there are certain people whose hardcore beliefs, you'll never be able to, to shake them. So do you just kind of like talk around those people? Do you try and I don't know. What's your thoughts? What are you hearing from your fellow citizens? Oh, you're on mute. You're on mute. So one of the things that we heard was, well, they have their expert. We have our experts, too. So we were talking about misinformation because a lot of times it's packaged, right, as Dr. So-and-so or, you know, the head of this organization. But the the important thing that that we heard from people was that People want to receive the information from trusted sources and that maybe we're interpreting what those trust wrongly what those trusted sources are. So people talked about organizations, you know, the Lions Club or this other man, you know, this other person said he was part of a, of a group and they could have a 15 minutes at the end of the meeting and have a presentation and try to teach some skills and that that would be so much more worthwhile than someone who he didn't know or he didn't have trust in doing it. So we talked, they talked a lot about uh, where is the information coming from? So you have to teach it. They're very, citizens were very interested in the future generations. And so that was what uh, the group addressed last week. And that was very hopeful to hear about all of those programs that are going on. And they, they wanted to know about that. Well, what are you doing for that? You know, if they didn't have children in the system, they wouldn't, they wouldn't know that. So it really was about engaging with local communities and community organizations and giving that, giving that information and that evidence in a way that was culturally sensitive, you know, in materials in various languages, and just 
geared to them. And it was very interesting because when we would, you know, it's, it was a dialogue. So I was listening and people would have so solutions saying, well, what about if we, you know, put everything on this website? And they say, oh, well, be careful where you put it because people won't trust that. Like, you know, like, like, oh, I don't know. You can't trust politicians or you can't trust these, you know, like the, the, the erosion of trust was what left me the most, uh, it was a thing that struck me. I knew it was there. I didn't know it was to that degree. And so I think that the, I think it was really like going back to the community level and, and uh, when we, um, our project with the public health units, people suggested things like, um, going to churches uh, where, where where communities gathered and having a clinic there or a session there. And so so it's really interesting that we've got this huge digital world and we're all connected and yet people are going this way. They're saying, okay, we're too connected. Bring it back in to the people who we know and who we trust. And that's not necessarily who, who you think it is. So it was quite interesting. Krishana, before we move on, I just thought, because there, there's a, a more comments coming in on this, you know, like um, people who are like their religious beliefs and uh, ideology, and it kind of, you know, um, really gives a lot of tunnel vision on certain topics, and just sort of what some of the work that you've been doing with Science Up First to, to try and address some of them. Yeah, I, I, and, and again, everything that was said um, leads into what I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm about to comment on because, so it comes back to trust and trustworthiness. So who do you trust and who is trustworthy to you? Um, so interestingly enough, within the communities that we've been working with, uh, you know, you know, we've been, we've been taking stock and, and getting some surveys back to, to really understand who are they trusting? So, you know, for example, one community were saying, you know, among the top three, they were, you know, talking about their healthcare providers, scientists, and family and friends. Another community would be, you know, saying family and friends, religious leaders would, would tend to you know so, so so it so who they trust tends to shift based on the community you speak to and and this is obvious right um for for many different reasons i did want to go back to um the peer-reviewed article um, mentioned because i saw that several times and i know beatrice mentioned this as well so access to, to peer-reviewed articles yes i agree extremely important just like media we want to have more open access the issue though with the peer-reviewed articles is not everyone can understand what's being said because it's a lot of scientific jargon for example right so i think what what is really important here is that we continue to invest in people who have skills to translate this information so that the public at large can understand it and this is something that science up first is doing so we're working this is what we do essentially right we have access to certain information we then translate that so that the public can understand. But we need more of that. It can't just be science up first. It can't just be, you know, one-off institutions or persons. We need more investment in people who can do this. And we've been noticing slowly that it's been happening in certain um, public uh, organizations and agencies where now we have, you know, people who we call science communicators because they're the ones who come in. They have the knowledge and the skill set to understand the science that's, you know, being spoken about in these peer-reviewed articles to then translate it so that the public can understand. Again, we saw this as a major issue again, which, you know, fed into the gap of knowledge and information during the pandemic. Lots and lots of information was coming out. We had an infodemic, which meant just too much information coming out at the same time, getting people overwhelmed. Now, if you can imagine experts were getting overwhelmed, I don't want to even know how the public was feeling, right? Um, and at that time, what was, you know, the lack of, um, you know, this accessible information wasn't even, I mean, you know, the access to information are on many levels and layers, including language and cultural uh, appropriateness, but then also, you know, from scientific jargon to, you know, everyday language that people can understand was, an, was another uh, major um, point. So I think investment in, in people who have the skill set to do this at large and having these people, um, you know, present at multiple organizations is going to be very important going forward because, again, that will bring access to the information, then that will start to also help to build trust and trust, you know, people will start to see these people as being trustworthy. Um, we need to be more open and transparent, right, about the information that we're sharing. And that also helps to build trust. And again, back to, you know, Maureen's point, 
who is trusted in which communities depends on which communities you talk to and who are the leaders and influencers in those particular communities. Yeah, thank you so much for that. You know, it, this conversation is, um, it's really eye-opening. It's really important to have. Um, we may have time for one or two more. We'll go if we do a sort of a quick round. Um, you know, one of the questions that came up and I think is interesting, um, and again, I'll sort of combine maybe a couple of them, but just this idea of, you know, if we're even doing enough to um, really normalize the, the co-creation and engagement with research that's being done and how kind of, you know, um, now that we, we've all talked about growing interest in equity, diversion, and inclusion, and how that can help accelerate these efforts, um, and sort of combining that with how we, you know, um, maybe are trying to reach different communities, you know, using different, um, like for instance, the example I've given was Indigenous uh, traditional knowledge, kind of incorporating the, you know, belief systems or knowledge of other groups into what we're disseminating. So it's a bit of a, a bit of a mouthful, but I don't know who wants to kind of lead us off in the last two minutes. I can jump in quickly, Carly. Please. So absolutely, uh, the co-production, the co-design is important. Uh, at COVID end, we put out a call to get. Oh, so the first thing I want to say was what the pandemic has done is it's 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 involved the citizens in 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 research partnerships. Whereas before, the the, the accent was always uh, on. Um, on patients and their families, but now it's public health, right? So when the pandemic struck, uh, there was a group that came together and they were all researchers and that, and I got involved as a citizen. We put out a call and for, for ordinary people to get involved with synthesizing evidence and 80 people, Canadians from all walks of life from all over the country answered that call in less than two weeks. And we trained 20 people and we brought them on. It's a drop in the bucket. <laughs> it's a, you know, like I, I don't want to overplay it. It's a drop in the bucket. How much impact they've had is difficult to really determine, but the interest is there. And that's how you create that culture of evidence is we brought people in who had never interacted with, with evidence at, the, at, at that level. And you hope that they're going to continue doing that and they're going to tell others and you're just going to develop that, foster a culture of evidence. Thanks. Thank you, Maureen. Um, just I'm being cognizant of time, so I'm going to maybe ask one more quick question um, and kind of going on some of the themes that people are talking about. So there's definitely, you know, I think a lot of us feeling a little bit um, you know, pessimistic or overwhelmed, you know, a couple of comments about how it's very difficult to foster trust when even our, our governments don't trust their own expert reports uh, or they, you know, make policy de decisions that are completely at odds with what the science is saying. We saw that a lot during COVID and so how we kind of can foster trust in that kind of an era. And then also, I think um, a good call to action for how we can, um, given some of those problems, how we can empower people who are on the ground to kind of go forth and counter some of these issues to fight back against mis and disinformation. Um, and Beatrice, I'll ask you to quickly weigh in on this as someone who works directly um, in the space of young people engaging with our democratic systems. Sure. Uh, I would like to plug a book, actually, that I just read that I found really interesting that uh, applies to this. It's Politics and Expertise, How to Use Science in a Democratic Society by Zainab Pamuk. And it talks about different sort of challenges of uh, combining democracy and science and how that is something that is really a, a challenging role and how to, to think about it. And one potential solutions he, he suggested was something called science councils. And I think that this really relates to what Maureen is saying, which is thinking about ways in which we can bring citizens in through different deliberative democracy processes, through citizens assemblies, through citizens panels, trusting them to, if they are given the tools and the resources, if we invest in giving them these tools to be able to make evidence-based decisions and giving them a voice in our democracy. And I think that's really sort of a very broad statement, but it's the key and thinking about more and more ways that we can get citizens to have voices in our society to make them feel empowered. And I think that's the best way to really uh, combat mis and disinformation. Thank you so much for that. And as we're approaching one o'clock, I know that um, you know this is our time. I wanted to say that this has been such a great engaging conversation. We could keep talking all afternoon. And I wanna thank everyone for all of the comments and the discussion, and especially to the panelists, Maureen, Beatrice, Prashana, thank you for um, uh, leading us in such an engaging topic today. Thank you so much thank for having me.
I'll jump in really quickly with just kind of a few closing words. So I just want to say thank you on behalf of E4G. This has been truly an incredible panel um, and a really, really interesting conversation. There's just been so much engagement in the chat. I know we didn't get to answer everybody's questions. Um, I believe Nada is going to drop a link in the chat um, to kind of the event post on Twitter and so and uh, Instagram. So if we didn't get to your question and you want to keep engaging with our panelists, please continue the conversation on social media. Tag these folks. Like, let's keep talking about this because an hour clearly wasn't quite long enough. Um, our last session for the Evidence Matters campaign is next Wednesday at 3 p.m., uh, where we'll actually be having a chat with Chief Science Advisor Dr. Mona Niemer. Uh, if you want more information on that, just visit evidencematters2me.ca. Uh, and then lastly, uh, we will be holding a draw for a few kind of evidence packages, um, TBD, uh, which will include a book on how to spot fake news, uh, which was created by one of our panelists last week, uh, Joyce Grant. So if you're interested in winning an evidence package, please use the hashtag, hashtag evidence matters on social media, and that's how you can get entered into the draw. Last but not least, um, you will receive a short feedback survey after you sign off, so please take a minute to let us know what you thought, um, just so we can improve for future events. And with that, thanks everybody, thanks again to our amazing panelists, and thanks everyone for tuning in. Thank you all.